I'm Marty Hurst. I'm the interim dean for the School of Information, and I'm really excited to introduce our speaker, our speaker today. But before I do, I have to make a little broadcast announcement that the announcement that this event is being live streamed and recorded, and may be posted on the web. If you ask any questions or make comments, they may be included in the live stream and recording. All right. Now that I've got that out of the way, uh, welcome again to the Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, before I start, I want to introduce our visiting professor who is here, Jevin West, who is actually visiting from UW. I hope you all get to know him while he's here. Really exciting guy working on misinformation, science communication, and so on. So welcome, Jevin. Thanks so much. Uh, all right. So I'd like to introduce our speaker, who's Dr. Ryan Kahlo. He's a professor at the University of Washington in the School of Law, as well as in the School of Information, a joint appointment there. He holds the Lane Powell and D. Wayne Gittinger Professorship at UW. And he's a founding co-director, along with Bacia Friedman and Yoshi Kono, who uh, visited here last semester, uh, of the, uh, oops, yeah, okay, of the Interdisciplinary UW Technology Policy Lab. He's also a co-founder, along with our visitor, Jevin, of the UW Center for an Informed Public. He's an institution builder, he's a cross-disciplinary scholar, he's internationally known for his research on law and emerging technology, and he's published uh, intensively on a wide range of topics, including privacy and the markets, uh, bots and the First Amendment, open government and the administrative state and state and automation. So really interesting guy. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Um, thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. It's I, I know so many of you uh, so well. It's a little bit like when your friend's band is playing and uh, <laughs> all of your friends come to the to the band. Uh, so I appreciate you coming to my to my show. Um, so uh, for those of you who are familiar with my work and 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 also for those of you who who are not, um, one of the areas that I've long been interested in is how. Um, the fact that we are mediated by technology that's designed by somebody else presents opportunities for mischief, manipulation, and the like. Um, and so what this talk is going to do is to bring several disparate phenomena, um, one of which I've looked at extensively um, and, and, and others that I'm newer to, but bringing these three phenomena um, under a common umbrella of socio-digital vulnerability, um, I want to explore the impact that social-digital vulnerability has on human autonomy by reference to three ways in which these manipulations interfere with autonomy. And then I want to talk very broadly about some of the bigger changes to law and legal thinking that would be necessitated to actually address these set of phenomena. So, the first is simply um, about the power to shape behavior with design. And so one thing that really struck me, it's January of 2024, the thing that really struck me was how uh, during January 6, there were people who were willing to scale walls, they were willing to break into uh, a, a, a building, a, a government building, uh, and then when they got into the building, uh, they walked in an orderly way right where the folks were. <laughs> you know what I mean? Why? Because, that, because that's how powerful architecture can be in channeling people's behavior. This is something we talk about often under the idea that code is law in the legal community. We talk about Larry Lessig's work, uh, Joel Reidenberg's work about the idea that um, you know, changes to architecture, in particular to code, can channel people's behavior. Think about the speed bump that slows you down uh, rather than the speed limit that you know, requests that you slow down and penalizes you if you don't. But actually this insight has a far longer pedigree. Uh, my favorite example is Bruno Latour's case of the hotel key, where he talks about how hotels are tired of get people taking their keys and losing them in Paris or wherever. And so they purposely made these keys really heavy so you'd be incentivized to leave them at the front desk, right? And the idea was that when you can't negotiate with people with norms, you can't negotiate with people with society, um, you, you uh, make your expectations durable. Um, and so the way that this is playing out today in contemporary um, internet commerce is through the rubric of dark patterns. So the first phenomenon I wanna talk about is dark patterns. Uh, these are tricks that are meant to extract social surplus, extract rent, 
uh, from uh, people that are engaging with digital systems. It's something that has been going on for a long, long time, but only as um, uh, only in the last couple of years, truly in the last two years, has the Federal Trade Commission um, um, uh, gone all in on this. People like uh, uh, Jennifer King will tell you that there are analogous prior cases that you could point to in retrospect and say, gosh, these were dark pattern cases. I know she worked on a couple of them. I know that, Jen. But in terms of formally calling out this phenomenon as a phenomenon, it's really been in the last couple of years. I think it's fair to say. Um, and so dark patterns are just, you know, just basically tricks and ways to channel you. There are things like making it hard to cancel stuff, varying terms, and so on. I just want to give you one example here uh, that I found um, on Harry Brignall's uh, excellent collection of dark patterns. I don't know if whether you can see that, but basically it gives you these options for notifications, but then when you actually go to, um, to, to flip them, uh, they pop back out. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And so it's just it's, it's a false choice, right? And so this is the kind of thing. Um, and, and so this is understood. There's a lot of questions about like, what makes a dark pattern dark? What's a what's a gray pattern that's maybe iffy, but not the kind of thing that would justify coercive intervention by government. Um, but this is a this is a phenomenon that's, that's being explored. My own work um, uh, has been about the role of not just the ability to design every aspect of an interaction, but the leveraging of personal information in order to do so. A phenomenon that I call digital market manipulation after the work of John, um, of, of Doug Kaiser and, and, um, um, and John Hansen, uh, uh, Hansen and Kaiser called it market manipulation, the idea that, of exploiting people's cognitive biases uh, in order to get more out of an interaction. And so that's why they, they claim everything costs $9.99 in, in Hansen and Kaiser, I write this series of papers in the 90s. Um, and uh, everything costs $9.99 because our brains think of it as further away from $10 than it really is, right? And so, they can, and so they talk about how firms are not only able to, but in fact incentivized by the market to exploit what they know about people's cognitive limitations in order to uh, extract more profit, more social surplus. Um, so what I layered into that was the idea of digital. So, you know, yes, it's true things cost $9.99, but it gets a lot more interesting and complicated and I think dangerous when we begin to layer in mediation and information. Um, and so one example that's from a Columbia Law Review article I wrote with um, a, a tech ethnog ethnog ethnographer by the name of Alex Rosenblatt, who at the time was at Data and Society, now actually works for Uber. But one example is uh, Uber's experimentation with surge pricing, where Uber would study whether people were willing to pay more for a ride if the battery uh, on their phone was low. Okay, so in an interview with Hidden Brain, the podcast, one of their designers admitted that Uber had looked at whether or not um, that people would be willing to pay more for a ride if they're if they were vulnerable in the sense that their that their battery was very low. Um, so this is not charging. This is not charging nine ninety nine. It's not even charging over your reservation prices. Like it's not even trying to discover how much you would pay and paying that. So that's certainly something we know that firms try to do. This is like exquisitely manipulating your experience on the basis of an invasive, no. Now, later on, Uber claimed that it, it, it didn't do that. Um, it was accused a few years after the Hidden Brain podcast of, of, of using um, uh, batteries as part of its surge pricing. The company claimed it didn't do that. The company claimed it couldn't do that. But at least, of course, in experimental conditions, it was able to do that, um, according to one of its employees. So who knows? But the point is, is that there's broadly a set of phenomenon that I characterize as digital market manipulation that involves knowledge about people uh, to accelerate market manipulation. This is one of my favorite little graphs. You can't see it, of course, but you know what it is, is it's, it's mapping out all sort of known cognitive biases. If you go onto Wikipedia, you'll find that there's 48 cognitive biases or whatever, right? Um, and you know, and, but my fascination with this with this area is that if you're talking about digitally mediated environments that are that are um, 
that are analyzed through machine learning, you don't necessarily need to know any particular bias, like status quo bias or you know uh, anchoring or price blindness or anything else. Rather, you can figure out what this person's limitation is. You can figure out that this person, after they've watched a sad movie on a Tuesday, is going to pay a lot for ice cream. Doesn't matter if there's a cognitive bias called Tuesday ice cream, right? And so the idea is with digital market manipulation means that never having to ask our reality. That is that you can come up with many, many more abilities to manipulate people. And so that's this phenomenon that I've talked about for years in a series of papers um, that many people have responded to and leveraged. Um, it's being used in Europe uh, as part of um, legislative efforts. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it, and it's just something that I find endlessly fascinating. The third phenomenon is a bit of a departure and it's gonna look different. And it's also helps explain why the co-author on this paper is an MIT Media Lab roboticist, Daniela DePaolo, who did a tremendous amount of the work here. Um, it, it, it's not a terribly long paper, but to the extent that it took effort, it was largely her effort. But the third is um, kind of an emerging issue that has finally come into the fore in a mainstream way. It's kind of where dark patterns were when Jen was working on them years ago, whereas it sort of understood that it wasn't a thing. And that is the ability of technology to present as social and to manipulate people socially. So what am I talking about here? Um, my colleague, uh, Jevin, and, and my colleague, um, uh, Peter Kahn, working with roboticists, he's a psychologist, studied people's reactions to anthropomorphic technology such as robots and found that people were real, real confused fundamentally about whether a robot was a thing uh, or a person or something in between. And, and, was, and this, this effect was so robust over so many different studies that they came up with this bombshell new ontological category hypothesis that human-robot interaction was different from interaction with any other kind of object or system. But you don't really need to go that far. All you need to do is look at the work of the late Cliff Nass at Stanford and Byron Reeves, who's still there, and BJ Fogg, and look at the area of computers as social actors to see that we are hardwired to react to anthropomorphic technology as though it were really social, right? So take the idea that you can design a digital environment, add the fact that you can design a digital environment based on the personal information that you're getting by virtue of the, of the environment being mediated, and then layer in the additional affordance of being able to present as though you were a human person. What do you get? This is not just totally speculation anymore. So this comes from work by Claire Bonet. Um, she is working on a case study at MIT around replica. Replica is a virtual avatar that people can sign up they can design and then they can interact with through large language model chat. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people are using Replica and other, other versions of this particular, um, of this particular technology. Um, they're, they're interacting with these systems every day. They're, um, they're getting attached to them and so on, okay? Um, two phenomena involving replica, just as examples, right? There's um, one of them is with replica, there is a free version of the service where you just get to chat with the friendly avatar that you designed, right? And then there is the upgraded premium version where you can chat with them in a way that's not so friendly. It's romantic, even possibly like uh, erotic, but you have to pay for that privilege or whatever you want to call it, that, that, that option, okay? And that's what a lot of people are using the system for. What Claire found, and this is an illustration of it that I just, uh, you know, uh, based on her work, um, what Claire found was that um, if you're using the free version of it, at some point, all of a sudden, Replica will say, hey, you know, I miss you. Can I send you a selfie of me right now? 
And the person who at this point, that doesn't do it immediately, it only does it if it sees a robust sort of interaction over a period of time. And then the person says, oh, yeah, you can send me a selfie, I guess, you know? A selfie gets sent, but it's blurred. And it looks like maybe something's going on there that's not entirely safe for work. I, I didn't include it, but you can see the top of it right here, but it's blurred. When the user goes to check on it, you know what it says? I can't show you this in the free version. You're going to have to upgrade for you, okay? Expect more like this, okay? I can recommend a number of different papers that evidence this phenomenon, Woody, Hart Woody Hartsock's um, uh, Unfair and Deceptive Robots being one example, but there's a bunch of different ones. I promised you two. Another example from the same sort of milieu. Um, the Italian Data Protection Authority called the Garante, catches wind that Replica, this European-based company, is creating these avatars that are interacting with people, sometimes in ways that are not the safe for work, okay? Or not you know, entirely um, platonic. Uh, and that's collecting personal data. And they go to the company and they say, you're in a, you're in a lot of trouble. The Garante is gonna come after you and fine you under GDPR because you are, you are doing this. Um, and, and I'll tell you what we're mad about. We're mad about the fact that you're collecting this data and we're mad about the possibility that kids can get into erotic chats with these, with these bots that would feel really lifelike to them. Speaking of kids, Jen. So, the, so in, in response, what does Replica do? Over a weekend, they just take out erotic chat. They erase it. And all of a sudden, all these people who had been interacting with this virtual, usually girlfriend, right? I mean, that's the gendered nature of this. All of a sudden, that system is trying to put them into the friend zone, for lack of a better way of saying that, but basically saying, no, no, that's not appropriate. Let's keep this, this friendly. And people were really disturbed and hurt. And the outcry was such that two things happened. Number one, that they ended up feeling that they needed to put self-harm prevention tools on the web, on the system. And number two, they ended up grandfathering in people and restoring erotic chat to them who had it before and just not offering it going forward to new people. <clears throat> it's really complicated because on the one hand, the Garante was worried about vulnerability. They're worried about the vulnerability of um, children and elderly, and they have a legitimate concern. On the other hand, the solution that Replica came to did not think about the vulnerable people who, what sort of vulnerable person was relying upon some non-human entity for companionship, including intimacy. That's a vulnerable person probably, or it's possible, right? So, okay. So then just quickly to um, uh, summarize where we are so far. So just talking about this, the fact that there's a bunch of different phenomena, dark patterns, digital market manipulation, uh, the, the idea of, of using um, uh, social reaction to technology for, for purposes that are, um, that are problematic. This set of, this set of uh, experiences that we're having, all of which have to do with uh, people being vulnerable in digital environments, okay? So we, Danielle and I wanted to bring these phenomena together and we wanted to talk about what the issue was in common with them. Okay, and so we decided to taxonomize <clears throat> the kinds of ways that these manipulations interfere with autonomy. And we calculated three dimensions, which I'd love to talk to you about. This is not, this is a work in progress, I should have said from the beginning, not published anywhere. Um, the first is decision. So the idea is that these systems purposely try to interfere with decision making in order to profit them more than you. So when you can't, when it's a lot easier to subscribe to the New York Times than it is to unsubscribe, that is an interference with digital um, uh, uh, digital processes, right? Um, the second is, is increasingly social. So it's the idea of hijacking people's social emotional um, relationships by presenting carefully designed non-human entities to enter into that world. Now, 
it's already been happening on a number of levels. So I wrote a paper with um, Sam Woolley and Phil Howard about the use of bots to interfere with elections, for example, and politics. And the idea there of making politicians look more popular than they really are, or going after people to, to you know, with misinformation and stuff that, that Jevin and I. And so it's not as though non-human entities have not interfered with things, right? But this is a little different because it doesn't just provide you with like large scale systemic social cues of the phenomenon. It like gets you invested socially in a way that renders you um, more uh, vulnerable. Um, and then finally, and this is the most theoretical claim, um, but finally, the idea of, um, of constitutive uh, interference. And so this, I would refer you to the work of Julie Cohen, uh, for example, at um, Georgetown, uh, in particular, configuring the network self, or I would look at Brett Frischman and Evan Selinger's Reengineering Humanity. This is a set of people that are talking about the way in which self-development and becoming and actualization, civic engagement, um, how these things are being channeled, manipulated, interfered with. Okay. And so that's it's, it, although while it's not going to be as easily actionable as some of the other kinds of interference, perhaps, um, in, in many ways, decisional interference. You know, consumer protection laws best able to handle social something if it gets mined around, perhaps, and there's analogs, but this is hard, it's constitutive, but nevertheless, worth talking about the idea that you you, you don't have, you know, uh, opportunities to, to discover yourself, to, to, to self-actualize, that in fact, your journey towards self-actualization is interfered with. And again, there's a whole body of literature around this. We're not trying to reinvent it. Okay. Last, um, I'm writing this book about law and technology, and in one chapter, one of the things I argue is that law and technology, law, legal analysis is different from so many other disciplines, and that there's like this expectation that you tell people what to do about the phenomenon that, you, that you've identified, right? If you're, you know, you're not just telling people how the world is, you're telling them what to do about it. Like we're super comfortable with normativity and should, um, outside, maybe outside of, moral philosophy, we're, we're the most comfortable with that. So I always feel as a legal scholar that I should tell people what they should do about it. Um, and, you know, and, and so this is that, that piece, um, but it's not entirely obligatory because the insights of what to do in the law are, are closely implicated with the phenomenon itself. So two things I wanna say. Number one is a, 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 a reason that law is not necessarily adequately well suited to address the set of phenomenon of, of social digital vul um, vulnerability is because it has a relatively impoverished understanding of vulnerability. And a lot of people have argued this in a lot of different contexts. Danielle and I hardly, we didn't discover this, right? But the idea is that ultimately vulnerability should be thought of as a layered concept, not as a binary where you're vulnerable or you're not vulnerable, right? Um, you have a status of vulnerability because you're a kid or you, you're, you don't have that status. Um, you, know, you, 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 you know, whatever happens to be. Um, and typically speaking, privacy laws and consumer protection laws have a habit of categorizing people in a status or relational way without unpacking the idea that we're all vulnerable sometimes and that these techniques can render us vulnerable. That vulnerability is contingent and vulnerability can be created and manufactured. And I've seen a couple of the, the papers that have cited to this paper already, the draft form have been citing to this proposition. The idea that you can render people vulnerable, vulnerability is not some pre-existing exogenous status. You know, vulnerability, you know, the people that were, were rendered vulnerable by replica were not necessarily vulnerable in general, they were rendered vulnerable by the context. Okay, so one thing we say in the paper at greater length than I have time for now is that um, that law has to do what many people argue it should do in a lot of contexts, be more nuanced about the concept of vulnerability, okay? But the second is 
we got to give up on the idea in consumer protection and, of, and a bunch of other areas that we can exclusively address things through the lens of harm, right? Um, and so I was very influenced very early on by Sam Bray, now at Notre Dame, who wrote this beautiful essay, Power Rules, that's about the idea that if you are trying to address a phenomenon in the world, you have multiple options. Some options, which is the most popular, is to, is to address harm. So the idea is that when someone does something harmful, you throw the book at them, right? Or you take steps to try to make sure that harm is mitigated or whatever it happens to be. And in consumer protection, we see a lot of that, even with the dark patterns work, you know, the idea is, oh, look, all these people subscribe to something that they didn't mean to, or they did subscribe and save, and now they're paying more than they, than they originally agreed. And so it's this way in which people have been tangibly harmed by dark patterns. And so therefore, when it's egregious, the Federal Trade Commission is going to come after them for it, as to make an example of them. You know, um, but there's myriad examples of this where you do something wrong, it's harmful, um, you're using a harm rule. Well, what Sam points out is that in other contexts, we have power rules. And the difference between harm rules and power rules is that power rules are expressly um, aimed at changing power dynamics, changing. Um, uh, thanks so much for coming, uh, Pam. I appreciate it. <laughs> I knew you got to go. Um, but at changing the, the power dynamics between uh, people uh, and institutions or people and each other. And so he gives many examples um, where you're either rendering a powerful party less powerful, maybe through antitrust or some other expedient, or you're empowering an entity, right? And so um, Danielle and I come to the conclusion in this paper that, you know, the, the way to address this broad set of phenomenon is to look not just at the possibility of throwing the book at people that are doing an egregious example of it, but fundamentally restructuring, empowering some people, disempowering others. Um, and, so, and so in prior work, I've been talked a lot about the role of incentives and how, how we can restructure digital environments to change incentives. And so this is an outcome. Okay. So, um, but just to be clear, while, while we do tell you what you ought to do and give you some ideas, like the primary contribution here is bringing together these disparate phenomena and talking about how they undermine. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and hope that we have some time for questions and answers. Yeah. <laughs> In some earlier discussions of AI, Mm -hmm. I heard the most extraordinary project, I heard of the most extraordinary project, in which uh, people had projected an enormous deficit of caregivers uh, in future generations, uh, in that um, <clears throat> people like us, if we're lucky enough still to be around, will greatly outnumber the people of an age who might be hired to uh, wipe our noses, let's say. <clears throat> and so, one AI visionary had proposed that um, a new kind of uh, being be created, which they called an AI buddy for every old person who was um, in need of one, which is practically everybody at a certain age, um, a, a being the, a kind of robot that would know all of the prescription needs, all of the health care requirements, and much of the biography of this person, because otherwise, all these old folks would no longer have anybody to talk to. They would they would be widowed or independent, uh, but uh, not uh, stuck into communities uh, as you are in your middle years. And this was put forward with uh, a lot of pizzazz uh, as a kind of visionary experiment. I thought it raised major ethical questions, but maybe you'll help resolve them by saying, should these, should these, should the human beings in the equation be classified as vulnerable simply because they're old? And should these 
robots, or buddies as they were called, uh, be classified as um, exploitative, um, manipulative, or any of, the, any of these other labels that uh, we've heard. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a, great, that's a great question. Um, I, I was at this convening at the University of Pennsylvania a couple weeks ago that was by their um, uh, nur nursing school, and it was funded by their Center on Gerontology, and it was all about how generative AI could be useful um, to um, gerontology. And, and obviously, one of the things that came up was uh, companions, but also um, reminders to to take medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and and indeed, I, I remember very uh, vividly that there there was this experiment done at Carnegie Mellon where they created something called a nurse bot, mm -hmm. and and it was very um, sort of boxy, roboty sort of thing. Um, and uh, and it was some place in the home, and the idea was it would, it, would, it would have a schedule of when someone had to take their medication, do whatever it happens to be, and it would it would go up to the to the subject, and it, it would it would say in a robot voice, you know, it's time to take your medication, right? And you might imagine that a lot of people just completely ignored it, and so it was not it was not successful. And they went back and they said, oh my goodness, what are we going to you know, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about this? And they decided to like, give it a personality. You know, and to have it to be more anthropomorphic and have eyes on it and speak in a, in a recorded voice. And sure enough, those changes caused a complete difference in the balance, right? So it's not to say that we can't leverage our hardwired reactions to anthropomorphic technology for ways that are good, right? It's just to say that when we do so, we create vulnerabilities. That's all, right? And so, it, you know, if if just that it's great for someone to have a new human companion who they just met and who's decided to to want to be, you know, say there's an isolated older person and they're at the opera and they sit next to some younger person and then they start to talking and that person becomes part of their community and comes over to their house all the time. Wonderful, wonderful, of course. Until suddenly their will changes and they they take out their whole uh, their, their whole family and all the money goes to this person they met at the opera. And then all of a sudden we're like, wait a second, wait a second. Well, we understand the notion of undue influence. But what the idea is that these systems present those same kinds of, con of, of concern. And I would argue that they could be worse. So um, BJ Fogg at Stanford has this concept of captology, which is persuasive computing. And he talks about how social machines have certain advantages over human persuaders, including uh, perfect memories, they can change their identity, they don't have any shame, they, they, they don't know all these different kinds of things. And so we might even be more you know, about, about this technology, but not to say that we can't. There might be certain contexts where it is deeply inhumane and also enabling us something wrong to leverage technologies in this way. So another reaction I have to your question is, should, should we really be relegating people of advanced years to isolation and then improving them, their isolation by giving them machines, right? Rather than come up with a different kinds of style configuration. One time I saw a paper at a conference, I'll never forget, where somebody proposed that we use um, basically chatbots, although it was years ago, uh, in solitary confinement to make sure that prisoners uh, uh, don't don't go you know don't have mental illness issues from being in solitary confinement. And my immediate reaction was like everybody else in this room, don't put them in solitary confinement. That's completely you know what I mean. And so, anyway, sorry, that's a long-winded response to your good question. Did you have a question too? Yeah, I, I love your shift from harm rule to power rule, mm. and I'm just sort of interested in it because I do think that harm it doesn't sufficiently. But can you give us specific examples of how the power rule might work in these kind of situations or in any situations? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it, so again, uh, just just to be clear that this, uh, as I mentioned, Sam Ray's and uh, just sort of embracing yeah. it for this way I'm interpreting it. So the way it works in um, uh, uh, other other contexts might be um, to, uh, for example. Uh, ban people who have a history of, of domestic violence from having any kind of, of weapon, um, or uh, relaxing weapon prohibitions on people who might find themselves in vulnerable situations, or requiring, one example that Sam gives is um, requiring that people who work 
after 11 o'clock in certain public building contexts be given protective equipment. Do you know what I mean? Like bulletproof glass or whatever it happens to be. So it puts an onus on the, the store or the, the um, business in order to, to protect people, right? Um, another example, which I mentioned, is the idea of, of antitrust. So to, to take away uh, a power, right? But how would that work in, in this situation? So historically, I've thought a lot about um, uh, uh, incentives instead of power. And so in my prior work, I suggested something that Europe just did, which is require that there be a paid option that doesn't have added. Yeah, exactly. And so the idea there would be that if there's a requirement of a paid option, um, that uh, that incentives would better align and it would be more about like, more like Spotify, where you're trying to delight the person, not necessarily sell them stuff or channel them to go um, But, you know, there's still plenty of room for shenanigans in an incentive based model. Um, so, uh, I mean, what... to some extent, GDPR is an extent to use power to control privacy violations. Yes, but. Yeah, and so the question is are there other ways that we can go about it? So, so um, what, one idea is that um, uh, th th that relates directly to to the presentation in, in the paper is the idea that you wouldn't be able to unilaterally change the affordances of, of a social system in response to like the garante telling you they're in trouble. So the idea being that like once you give somebody um, a, a particular social affordance, that there's a reliance interest there, and you can't unilaterally take it away. That would be a power difference, right? That you literally cannot change your code, you know. And and, 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 and it's not such a weird thing because in, indeed, like you, in many contexts, you have to ask people again to be using the data. So that would be a kind of intervention. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's hard to think about some people. Some of them are hard. Yeah, I, I sat around like I, I think I need to do more work sitting around to come up with more concrete examples. The one we use in the paper is the one about making it impossible to you because like. Daniela, who's a social roboticist, pointed out that like people were so upset about Ivo, Sony stopped supporting Ivo dogs, and because they would they would break, and people got super in invested in them, and they couldn't get replacement parts, and they couldn't buy a new one, and they they have like funerals for their dogs. Oh, and, and so there was a paper at my conference that I organized with a couple of people, we wrote about, where somebody presented a paper about uh, designing for exit. Meaning if you do create social technologies that people get attached to, like you obligated to like come up with a plan for phasing them out, given what you know about human um, psychology, those kinds of things are what I'm, I'm talking about. Um, yeah. I want to take a question from the online audience, which okay. is oh, sure. pretty large, uh, from Dave Russell. How do these concepts of vulnerability in digital environments map to the responsibility of trust and safety teams, mm. uh, especially in social media environments? Are there examples of community guidelines that do a good or bad job of promoting digital safety? Gosh, that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, so, you know, it kind of reminds me a little bit of, of your and my conversation, and, and since it's, I will only represent my side of that conversation. Um, uh, but basically, you know, I think there's been some widespread understanding that online toxicity, dark patterns, uh, bias issues, and other and other information-based harms online necessitate some apparatus for ad addressing them and, 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 uh, re and remedying them. And I think that we're at a moment where we're feared of technology it's not dissimilar to the late 60s, early 70s, when we were really concerned about, um, when many people were really concerned about genetics, nuclear power, and we spun up agencies like the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which still exists, which your colleague Deirdre and Mulligan worked at, um, but as well as Office of Technology Assessment, which was defunded in the English Revolution, um, in order to bring together multidisciplinary experts in order to come up with guardrails and to, to the, in, in Lawrence Tribe's words, channel technology through law, right? And I think this particular wave, what happened was that industry saw this coming and was like, you know what, we're on it. We're gonna build these giant responsible X, responsible Y teams, you know what I mean? And they did, they, they invested all this money and they brought in all these experts and everything else who came in there and, and tried to work on issues like, like this, 
don't take advantage of people, mitigate bias, privacy, and so on. But then the minute the market turned, a lot of those people got thrown out the door. And so I think there's some, so what I, what I would say is that, you know, trust and safety teams are great, but I think there needs to be like government intervention that tells these folks, this is what you are expected to do. And this is a lot of how you're gonna do it. You know what I mean? Because I don't think that it's, um, I don't think it's it's okay but on, in, in and of itself, right? Um, examples of people that do it well, I mean, Twitter was doing it really well until Elon Musk came around. And, 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 and I think places like Spotify and League of Legends, and there's a bunch of examples of communities that are doing a good job of this stuff, right? But, you know, unfortunately, somebody can come in and, 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 and disrupt it overnight. I think you have your hand up here. I always love to talk, and I'm super excited about the Norman proposals from the Walter Stack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just wanting to ask about your vulnerabilities. Proposal. Yeah. And it sounded like you're saying more is you know categorizing people as a status, and that's not you must not be too much somewhere for that space then these are people who are not generally considered vulnerable until they're accused of a crime, and then once they're accused, the whole power of the state comes down on you and you're very vulnerable. So you want you know procedural protections there just for that. Um, and then, last thing on there, but I'm not working on contracts. I think there are contracts with adhesion, talking of contracts with people who, and, and then um, nutritional information would be you know, another one. So, where, you know, do you think of the possibility that law does what you want it to be in other contexts and use you can extend it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, I, you know, I, I was very influenced by um, Seduction by Contract. I don't know if you read uh, Bar Bargill's great uh, book about this, um, Opal and Barger. It, it's it, it, this, you know, contracts is a, is a really good place to look for how to address asymmetries. And there's all these great tools like Contra Preferendum, all these different tools that you can, you know, that you can, um, that you can invoke. Um, and, uh, and, and many of them are constitutional common law, right? So I teach shorts, but when I, when I think about things like, you know, uh, unjust enrichment, uh, undue influence, and, and, and so on, I think once upon a time, consumer protection law had a lot of that to it. Um, <clears throat> I believe that, that the reason that the Federal Trade Commission is, is charged by Congress to, to um, prosecute unfair and deceptive practice was because originally the conception was that it just wasn't fair that big business was going to be able to step on the necks of consumers and have a very moral public interest uh, conception. And so in my piece with Alex in the Columbia Law Review, which is a, this, this is a, a short piece, you know, but it's a much longer article. Um, I, I actually talk about excavating the original uh, floor debates about the FTC Act and talking about how morally charged it was, right? Um, and the idea that it was really about unfair, can we call it unfairness, right? And so the idea that um, the other thing that happened in the English uh, Revolution, in addition to OTA being uh, funded, was that Congress codified the cost benefit analysis requirement. Um, for the unfairness policy for the Federal Trade Commission. So in many ways, it's like looking to other areas of law, but also resuscitating the original, you know what I mean, ideas within, within. Um, so I, 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 when I'm saying that, that there tends to be a binary, it tends to be relational, um, I'm actually talking primarily about consumer protection laws, especially statutory ones. So I'm talking about the um, you know, child uh, online privacy protection act. I'm, I'm talking about uh, students with FERPA. I'm talking about how to, you know what I mean? It, it, it tends to be relational status, a uh, context specific, um, rather than, than recognizing that vulnerability is a state that people can enter into, right? Um, I, I would quibble only slightly with your characterization of criminal, criminal justice, because it's true not everybody would be vulnerable but when the state comes down on that. But still, it has a kind of a, a a binary component, right? So I think of like the, the case where um, there's two black men on the bus and um, a police officer comes up to them and says, can I search your bag? Do you know what I mean? And in that moment, they're not, 
criminal and no one's been not, the criminal system has been brought black to bear. If they were rendered, I think you probably would agree, they were rendered vulnerable and so we question whether there was adequate consent. So I, I absolutely agree with you that other areas of law do have a much more nuanced understanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This relates to some of these discussions, but I mean, I like how you're, uh, I agree with the characterization of it as layered and continuous. Um, and as you think about your taxonomy, uh, you know, when you talk about uh, market manipulation, I'm also left wondering, like, this seems like a very continuous concept. Like, where does standard discriminatory pricing and, like, algorithmic targeting end and what you're referring to as more like market manipulation as a more, like, harmful, pernicious system begin? And to what extent does, like, in a taxonomy, do you need to be able to codify, like, some discrete breakpoint between, like, ordinary you know, profit maximizing business and something that is more legal. Yeah. So, I mean, so what I would say is that is that each of, of these different contexts, whether it's uh, uh, social hacking, you know what I mean? Um, social manipulation, um, uh, whether it's digital market manipulation, as I'm calling it, or whether it's dark patterns, they're all going to have line drawing problems because there's going to be things that were perfectly fine. You know, I mean, do I object to the fact that Toucan, Toucan Sam, an anthropomorphic, you know, <laughs> pelican or whatever, is used to sell Fruit Loops? You know what I mean? Like, no, right? Um, do I love that Fruit Loops are put at a high level for a toddler so that they nag you? You know what I mean? Uh, to buy them when you go to a grocery store? Yes, right? So like, you know, and so um, all of them are gonna have line drawing concerns. Um, and different uh, scholars have have tried to answer questions like what what makes a dark path, what makes a dark pattern dark, or where do we where do we draw the line? And in my own work on digital market manipulation, I talk about where I draw the line there, right? But in this project, we're just trying to back up a little bit and say you can define a phenomenon as digital market manipulation, and then you can have a line drawing conversation, or you can define something as a dark pattern, you can have a line drawing conversation. But what, what's gained by backing up at a level of abstraction and just asking ourselves, what is this? what are these sets of phenomena that Scott and Kuhn are talking about, right? Um, we're talking about susceptibility, vulnerability from being in a mediated environment. And we're local, locating the problem in the prospect of three types of interference, social, constitutive, and um, And then we're uh, asking the legal community to respond by being more nuanced about the concept of vulnerability and also exploring the prospect of reconfiguring power. Um, I think that these questions of line drawing will inevitably invariably arise, but they happen at a, at a much more sort of practical on the ground level. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's like the difference between saying, how should we determine whether someone has been negligent? Well, let's use a reasonable person standard, you know? Um, Okay, well, that sounds great. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll look at we'll look at the subjective standard that we particularize in particular ways. Well, the reasonable person standard. That all sounds well and good, but of course, gosh, what's you know what's reasonable, what's not reasonable, right? I do I do a whole two two days on that in my in my torts class. Once you get down to well, applying this idea, then of course there's going to be line drawing problems. You know what I mean? And so I guess we're not quite there yet. Um, um, and indeed, I think the exercise of backing up and looking at the phenomenon more broadly exacerbates the problem of, of, line, of line drawing. Um, I think one of the reasons that, for example, the Federal Trade Commission has embraced dark patterns is because it can get its head on this for purposes of explaining it to a court and protecting consumers. You know? Uh, Je Je oh, I'm sorry, please. Yep. I don't know who's next. I think, yeah, yeah. Right here. I, think uh, I think it was Alex, and then I don't. So Josh has to yeah. Josh has to question about the, the darkness of the behavior. So I want to ask a question about the patternness of it. Um, does the pattern have to arise through some concerted effort on the part of leadership or uh, product management at a company? Or can the pattern arise more as an emergent phenomenon, just from engineers building things, pushing tiny little metrics forward, and the pattern comes together of like, oh, wow. Now this is like something that we would call not only a darkness pattern, but a pattern. 
Yeah. Because I think the answer to that shapes where you would enforce the regulation. I think that's right. Yeah, I think that's right. I think there is a prospect. Thanks so much for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I, I I think that I think that you know um, from a perspective of am I worried about it? Then I'm 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 also worried about things that just happen in an emergent, phenomenal kind of way. Yeah. And and when when things happen that are bad from an, an emergent perspective, then we do need to be looking at different kinds of legal interventions because we don't want ones that rely upon intention. Uh, you know, mens rea, whatever it happens to be. Um, so it's more like how there's great to see. You, is it more like how there's disparate impact as well as disparate treatment in um, in, uh, in discrimination, right? There's both the idea that people can treat people differently on purpose in a way that's problematic, and there's putting into place structures that happen to have this kind of you know this kind of bad effect. Um, but I I'm I'm primarily concerned about two scenarios. One in which they're in which the firm uh, usually is specifically uh, uh, leveraging um, uh, vulnerability in order to extract some kind of some kind of benefit for itself, right? Or it, it is creating an optimization function that has that uh, impact. Do you know what I mean? Like and so and so I think we can still blame then right. <laughs> uh, but I but I do agree that you might need to interfere different. Does that make does that make sense? I mean, yeah. Um, but it's a great question because yeah, it 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 has a different moral valence if the system happens to do the shitty thing as opposed to the person did it on purpose, right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for your talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's such such an important topic. So I want to go back a little bit back to to the incentives mm. that you suggest. Because I wanted to raise this question about AI priming, which is kind of a new thing that that was just introduced a couple of months back, um, actually by the MIT Media Lab. They've shown that they, um, if you prime beliefs about AI, so present AI as a certain as of a certain kind, as being empathetic, as being manipulative, as being trustworthy, people will react to it in that way. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, it was a pretty convincing study. Um, and this, this leaves a lot of space really in the design of these technologies, but also um, in their presentation of the market and you know that, that could be regulated. So I wonder what you think about that, because there's clearly this mental, image of the AI that users have that we know it's very anthropomorphic and we have to work with that. We know it's very it's a very strong impulse. Yeah. Um so yeah I just wanted to raise this question because to me it's a very exciting area of study where a lot can, can be done both you know in the design both at the tech firms and then outside too. Yeah that's fascinating. So hmm. Well, first of all, I'd love to see the study if you were willing to, to yeah. help me find it. But sure. um, the second thing is, um, so the, the literature that I'm most familiar, so I'm, I'm most familiar with the literature that follows the computer to social actors methodology, which takes a phenomenon that we know human beings react to when it comes to other human beings, and then substitute something non-human and sees whether the same interaction is. Yeah. You see what I mean? Like that's the methodology, right? And so there's pretty robust studies uh, about that. And so there's studies about like how if you, um, so the idea is you're using anthropomorphism to try and be easy. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's one study that I love where <laughs> the researchers showed in, in a, an office setting that people were more likely to pay for coffee on the honor system if you put a pair of eyes over the collection plate than if you put flowers, right? Um, so, but, and of course, I'm also familiar with the framing and priming literature in psychology that says that you can have these effects. In fact, oftentimes we're, we're aware of it from the perspective of how do you know you're not priming? <laughs> like, as you know, it's, it's going to mess up your experiment because you're inadvertently fair. Um, but I've never heard of combining those two things together, and it makes a lot of sense to me, right? Um, um, and of course, you know, if you're if you're McDonald's, you want to you want the kids to see all the McDonald's characters as being affable, funny, lovable creatures that care about you, 
not corporate mascots trying to get you to lure you into, <laughs> into the McDonald's universe, right? And so my, my concern would be that that priming would um, be a battleground, but primarily would be used by corporations to deepen the impact of their organization. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, but fascinating. I'd love to see the study. Okay, Did you have a follow-up? Follow yeah. Okay. Did you have a follow-up too, or are you? No. Uh, well, I do have one. Yeah, yeah, I thought you <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Yeah, 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 okay. Well, maybe we'll talk after. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I feel like your work, I'm a big fan of your work, Brian, and I can't wait to read. Where can we find your article, actually? I don't think you said. Well, this article is a short article. It's on SSRN, okay. uh, right. but we're kind of, you know, give me feedback because we're, we're iterating. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I look forward to meeting. Um, so I feel like <clears throat> a lot of what you are taking aim at is the reasonable consumer standard. I can't even call it a standard. Mm -hmm. um, and even when I do work with the FTC, they're kind of like, don't think about the reasonable consumer, yeah. <laughs> which you know makes you feel like it's just worthless. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to ask you is, um, if we are shedding, as dark patterns do and cognitive biases do, a lot of doubt on the concept of the reasonable consumer, and as a lot of the work in privacy does as well, that we can't, you know, we don't approach these problems with a rational mind we can't calculate the trade-offs and there's just no there's no way to do it in so many contexts what do you see that being replaced with is that more of the fiduciary model that many of us have been kind of thinking about and i guess the the kind of follow on to that is that does that lead us into a world where we end up being almost like a checklist of vulnerabilities the same way i think a lot of discussion of privacy harms right now i'm sorry ai harms potential um, ends up being almost like a checklist of like what kind of like vulnerable social or protected class are you in that we need to look for when we're yeah. talking about bias, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's almost yeah. like we go from this, is it homo economist, um, <laughs> yeah. to, you know, here's my list of all the ways in which I'm vulnerable, yeah. but maybe that is the, the layered way of looking at it that we need to do, but it just seems so contrary to how the legal system and the courts think about this, which I think are such a strong economic arm you know, in calculation terms. Yeah, so, I mean, for, for anyone who's not, maybe not following the policy space quite, quite as closely, Jen is referring to the, the allure of, of uh, imposing a, a fiduciary duties uh, upon uh, firms uh, to, to um, uh, act in the best interest of, of their consumer, or if you're Hartzog and Richard's uh, duties of loyalty or, you know, whatever it happens to be. Um, and they're really attractive because it is widely understood that people can't really protect themselves and police the market with the information that they have and with the time that they have. Um, I mean, you know, you could look at a fiduciary duty as a power rule. Yeah. Um, you said that, yeah, and 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 I think that um, I think that that is uh, uh, that's the closest I've ever personally come to sort of endorsing that approach to say it could be an example of a phenomenon of, of a of a thing I want to do, um, but I am a little skeptical um, of of the fiduciary approach, so, somewhat for the pros and con reasons, but for other other reasons too. Um, you know, uh, you know. I think I think that um, you know. I, I I do I do think that uh, uh, at the end of the day, um, we do need to resort to to top down uh, regulations that um in, impose tangible obligations on firms depending on the use case and so for that reason i'm excited about the ai act um i like that approach um for, for those of you who don't know the ai act which we don't i don't know that we have the newest text for yet but basically would impose lesser or greater obligations on on ai um providers um based on the kinds of harms that they might risk you know what I mean? But they're very tangible. It's like if, you know, if, if, if some things are banned outright and other, that, that some things that I actually talk about in this paper might, might be banned outright as being, um, like you can't use AI to emotionally manipulate people that are vulnerable, like it's in the act, you know what I mean? And so like that, that kind of thing. Um, 
But yeah, no, I mean, I, I certainly think that Danielle and I are circling around the same damn problem that the privacy community has been for, for, for decades. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to ask a different question? <clears throat> More of a question of this intersection of law and computer science or law and technology that you're working in. Mm -hmm. you, <clears throat> you made one comment, which I found really interesting, which is that the law tends to bend things um, and not have new ones, uh, which I think is more true of technology where you're either in a category or you're not. Mm -hmm. And I thought law was actually much better at seeing the nuances and like looking at the case and the situation and the context and ruling based on that. So that was sort of a question slash observation. And then the other one is, um, I have noticed this about law writing that it does sometimes say should. And I once asked a colleague in the law who had said we should do this uh, on what basis yeah. was that? Uh, what was that based on? What empirical evidence? And that person said, oh, none. Just think it's a good idea, which I found somewhat shocking. So can you talk a bit about that relationship about how law and technology approach problems? I mean, look, I mean, law is, a, is an incredibly complicated, multifaceted thing. And, and, and the sources of law are quite varied. Um, and when you intervene in the space, you can intervene with something more amorphous, like a standard, which expect there to be interpretive nuance or a rule which doesn't you, you know what i mean um and there's common law which evolves with judges and so on. so i don't mean to say that the law isn't nuanced in general i'm just saying that consumer protection statutes tend to look at vulnerability as status-based it's pretty modest yeah right? that, okay yeah i accept that um so uh, and, and as Rebecca was pointing out, like we could draw from other areas where there's greater nuance in order to inform how we protect yeah. consumers. And I think yeah. what I mean is a computer science status space would be defined much more rigidly than I think the law would. But I agree that yeah. that's, it's a category. The category with the boundaries would be enforced more crisp, more uh, rigidly. Yes. I would say. It's pretty damn rigid. For, for right? example, okay. the idea that you're under the age of 13, all of a sudden you have access to all these different you know, you know, protections. like. I don't know how to be more rigid than that, right? Yeah. Okay. So, but yes, but in, in general, um, the, the way that computers are gonna be sorting people, classifying people, um, and, 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 and many scholars like Daniel Citroen argues this, uh, I think that's largely the thesis of Kate Crawford's book, Atlas of AI, the idea that like we're reproducing sort of, you know, uh, uh, Western colonial logics <laughs> of classification, you know, it's like, all, it's basically all seeing like the state, but now automated, right? Um, th th but I wanna get to your point about normativity. So in this book that I'm writing that I will one day be done with, I don't know how people like you write uh, books from start to finish in a, in a, in a reasonable amount of time, but um, you know, I, I, uh, I argue as a step in the method that I propose for law and technology that, that when you go about making prescriptions, you need to give us your normative basis. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so live, like literally, like, are you a capabilities person, cost-benefit analysis, Kantian, what are you? You know what I mean? Like, what, where's, your, where's the should coming from? Are you trying to restore the status quo ex ante prior to disruption? So I'm super symp sympathetic with that and have very little patience with my colleagues who just say should all the time without <laughs> any basis for that. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. We have time for maybe one, one more question. On this very point, but very briefly, I think any effort to make a calculus of vulnerability uh, has to be uh, inevitably historical. In other words, mm -hmm. what counts, what makes for vulnerability in the third decade of the 21st century is a lot different from when the first privacy debates broke out, for example. Yeah. And there's some uh, marvelous early privacy articles that Talk about vulnerable information or uh, information that should be very, very closely protected because it's so damaging. The fact that you might have a black ancestor, for example, which new people don't hardly give a hoot about it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's just in the nature of social vulnerability and social relations, really. That's a very, very good point. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a response to that part from saying that that's a very good point. Like, I, I, I like your example in particular. Um, right. I mean, you know, I, I think that we say in the paper, it's contextual, it's relational, we embrace like Luna's formulation, Florence Luna's formulation, but um, I think it would make sense to, to say that it is so socially and culturally situated. You know, I, I think that's important, and I think we're going to add that to a future draft. 